Thanks, Chris. From Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, it's ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Tonight, the Boston Red Sox and American League MVP candidate Mo Vaughn take on the New York Yankees and Don Mattingly. It's the ESPN Sunday Night Game of the Week. The Boston Red Sox have long since run away from the rest of the American League East. They had a stretch in August where they went 20 and 2. But the New York Yankees are in the wild card race. Seattle was a winner today. The Yanks need a win here tonight to remain a half game back in the wild card derby. Hello, everyone. I'm John Miller. And tonight, the Red Sox trying to do in the Yankees. And of course, the Red Sox have had a great year. They buried the rest of the division. Mo Vaughn having an MVP season. What a year for Big Mo. But it was when Jose Canseco got hot in August that the Red Sox ran away from everyone else. Here with me is Joe Morgan. Despite the Red Sox great season, they've lost a couple of games here. Yesterday, beaten by a young lefty, Andy Pettit. Now tonight, they face another young lefty from the Yankees, Sterling Hitchcock. Well, Mo Vaughn led the Boston attack earlier in the year. Canseco has been hot lately, so they've widened their gap. The only problem the Red Sox have is complacency. And if you look at what has happened here the first two ball games, they've fallen behind and have not fought back like they had in the past. So that's something you have to look for tonight. All right. So the Yankees, meanwhile, have some more really pragmatic worries. They've got to win to stay in this race. Got a lot of road games at the tail end of the year. Eric Hansen goes for Boston tonight. He's won 13 games, and he, along with Tim Winkfield, a 15-game winner, have really been keys for the Red Sox success. And Eric, Eric Hansen has been doing it without his great curveball. But against this Yankee lineup that now has Wade Boggs and Bernie Williams hitting at the top and Paul O'Neill very hot, this lefty lineup is going to be very tough on him unless he can use his curveball more effectively tonight. It could be a tough task. So it's the Yankees and the Red Sox from Yankee Stadium, and the Yanks are going for the sweep. It's a cool night. Stay with us. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball and the Boston Red Sox. They have over the years been known for their hitting and again this year that has been the case. It had not been the last uh, three or four years. Kevin Kennedy the new manager of the Sox. He's got him headed into October baseball. There's Jim Rice the hitting instructor for the Sox and uh, here's the lineup. Willie McGee leads off in right field. John Ballantin is at shortstop having a great year. Mo Vaughn MVP candidate 107 RBIs at first. Jose Canseco he's been hot the last six weeks the D.H. Tim Naring at third base. Mike Greenwell, another one of the Red Sox leaders in left field. Mike McFarlane, the catcher. Lee Tinsley just back from the disabled list in center field. And Luis Alisea is at second base, hitting ninth. And on the mound for the New York Yankees, who have just taken the field, young left-hander Sterling Hitchcock. And uh, he's got very good stuff, and sometimes he's good. Sometimes he's not. Well, the problem with Hitchcock is throwing strikes. And when he stays ahead of the count, He's been very effective because he gets the hitters to chase that fastball that tails away from them. But if he doesn't, then he has to come in with the fastball, and he has not been as successful when he falls behind the count. And let's take a look at the Yankee defense. You know, the Yankees have three gold glove winners on their infield, Wade Boggs, Tony Fernandez, and Don Mattingly, who has nine, which is a record for first baseman in the American League. So very good infield and Bellardi is playing second base tonight in place of Kelly so pretty fine infield if you're going to take it person by person and as a group they play pretty well. Wade Boggs who's also been red hot with the bat Friday night here in the first inning against Tim Wakefield Darrell Strawberry hit this one off the facing of the upper deck a three run first inning homer and the Yanks went on to win it eight to four then yesterday. Andy Pettit had great stuff. He struck out Vaughn. Then he got Canseco with that slider. And he was getting all of the Red Sox most of the day. The Yankees won that game 9-1. to one. And uh, there's Buck Showalter, the Yankees manager, trying to get them into October baseball. Only the, the fact of the wild card system has the Yankees able to think that right now because the Red Sox just went away and buried the Yankees, the Orioles, and the rest of the division with their red-hot stretch Back in the month of August, they went 20 and 2. So we're ready to play ball now, and uh, Willie McGee will be leading it off. Buck Showalter, who many think uh, may not be back as the Yankee manager next year, his contract is up. Of course, we're ahead of ourselves now. Here's Willie McGee, 305, two homers, 15 batted in. McGee was out of work until the Red Sox picked him up, and now they're glad to have him. 
He's had 167 at bats. And he has hit 388 as a right handed bat. Here's the first pitch, and it is low for ball one. We are underway at the big ballpark in the Bronx. Temperatures here in New York City are supposed to get down into the 50s during the night. It was a beautiful day today here, though. That fastball's over the outside for a called strike. The wind is blowing across from left toward right, although inside the big bowl of Yankee Stadium, we don't know what effect that will have on the flight of any balls hit in the air. He tends to get in here and spin around. There's a pickup by Fernandez at short, and McGee is out number one. Yankees have had Joe a very strong defensive club this year. They've only made 69 errors in 125 games, one of the best figures in all of baseball. But that has not translated into success. The Red Sox have been one of the worst teams defensively, and yet look where they are in the standings. Well, it kind of kills that old saying that pitching and defense will win you a lot of ball games. Cleveland Indians, another ball club that's made a lot of errors this year. And of course, they have the best record in all of baseball. Ballington takes ball one. Now, this guy is going to be one of the most outstanding players that people have not heard of. 290 average, 24 homers, and 88 runs batted in, 31 doubles. And he leads all Major League shortstops in home runs and RBIs, which, as Cal Ripken has shown over the years, can be a real plus for a ball club to have your shortstop. Producing the power numbers. Well, your shortstop basically is supposed to play defense, and any hitting you get from him is a plus. Your shortstop, second baseman, and your center fielder, the middle of your diamond, along with your catcher, are basically supposed to be there for defense. And this ball, two, two and one. Ballington at the plate with Mo Vaughn on deck. And of course, the two from this area, they went to college in this area over at Seton Hall University. There's Big Mo on deck. Field side and into the upper deck. Two and two to Ballington. Last time we did a Boston ball game, we talked about the fact that Ballington had made a conscious effort to build himself up and make himself a stronger hitter rather than just be a normal shortstop. He has put on a lot of strength by lifting weights and has become a very good power hitter as well as just a good shortstop. Yeah, he was on. Some very good Seton Hall teams with some excellent talent, such as Mo Vaughn and, and Craig Vigio. And he was not even considered a prospect when he first got to college. Down he goes. Strike three. And that's what I was talking about earlier as far as Hitchcock is concerned. If you get ahead in the count, you can get the hitters to chase the breaking ball. And you'll see that this pitch is not a strike, but with two strikes, the right-handed hitter, the left-handed hitter, they're going to chase that pitch because they're not going to be called out on strikes. So they end up chasing that breaking ball. And he's done very well with Mo Vaughn. Mo's only one for 14 against Hitchcock. Mo, well, first ball swinging. Right to Velarde. And he throws him out. And uh, Hitchcock has an easy first. Wade Boggs will be coming up. Then Bernie Williams and Paul O'Neill. John Miller and... Joe Morgan back here at Yankee Stadium ESPN Sunday Night Baseball and Buck Showalter manager of the Yankees trying to get them into October the Yankees have hit well for average but they're way down in the league in home runs and uh, just in the middle of the league in runs per game here's the lineup Wade Boggs having another uh, outstanding year hitting 330 at third base Bernie Williams in center Paul O'Neill red hot and right strawberry the DH Deion James in left Mattingly at first Stanley the catcher hitting seventh Fernandez at short and Velarde at second hitting ninth on the mound for the Red Sox right hander Eric Hansen Hansen a 13 game winner for the Sox and he's won in spite of the fact that they've been without Roger Clemens until the second half let's take a look at his numbers he's given up quite a few hits 162. And let's take a look at his pitch scripts. Four seam fastball, he throws. He also throws a cut fastball. And he also throws the famous circle change. And Eric Hansen was also known to have one of the best curveballs in baseball before his arm problems this season. We asked him to demonstrate it. The curveball is, uh, is a choke grip, one finger up the ball. 
and it's spring-loaded in there, as you can see, with all the tension. And if I let go, it spins. <laughs> I think the interesting thing there, John, is a lot of people think you throw the curveball with your wrist. He shows that you flip it out of there, get a lot more spin on it. Wade Boggs leads it off, and there is strike one call. Boggs is hitting 330. Five homers and 55 runs batted in, a 414 on base average. Look at it. One ball and one strike. And a little wake-up call. See the target is low and in, and this one gets away up and in. Pitcher never minds that pitch going astray after you have the strike on the first hit. And now it is two and one. It's interesting though the way you put it. Uh, Parker was slowing in, and this one just kind of got away from him. Wow. That happens every once in a while. And there for a strike, two balls and two strikes. And then he's able to hit the outside corner with an off-speed pitch. So he's, uh, his control is back now. Yeah, just lost it for one pitch. In the dirt, and it's full, three and two. Now, Hanson has one of the great curveballs in baseball today, but he has not been able to throw it much of this year because of the elbow problems as you had pointed out Joe and it'll be interesting to see how many he's able to throw tonight or how many he tries to throw tonight they wanted to get it back for the postseason the pitch that he bounced appeared to be a curveball he held on to it a little too long the 2 2 pitch so there's Al Nipper the pitching coach Nipper brought in from the minor leagues the season was going along. He did not start the year as the pitching coach. And that one's into the upper deck. Three and two to count. And since Nipper has come in, Roger Clemens has started been he started pitching like Roger Clemens again. He had some arm problems and some mechanical problems. Right to the second baseman. And they say still got it. And there is one away. Boggs is down. Now let's take a look at the Boston Red Sox defense. Not a very good defense. John Valentin at shortstop has been a stabilizing influence on the infield. But again, this is not a very good defensive ball club, the Boston Red Sox. But Valentin has been pretty steady at shortstop. Along with his hitting prowess. Here's Bernie Williams and that batting average, 297. 16 homers, 74 runs battered in. Switch hitter. Strike one on the inside. They put Boggs at leadoff and Williams at number two early in August after they released Luis Polonia. And since that move was made, both Boggs and Williams have been real high. That balls into the upper deck. Two strikes to Bernie. In 30 games since that move was made, look at that. Boggs hitting 395 and Bernie Williams 355. And the two have combined for 49 runs scored in those 30 games. Great pitch. Nice pitch over the inside. Strike three. That's a great pitch. When you're ahead in the count, you start the ball off the plate inside. It's really a tailing fastball. He comes across. And now watch the ball start inside and move back out over the plate. Look at that movement. Great movement there on the pitch. It starts way off the plate inside and just moves back on the inside corner. Most left-handed hitters will give up on that pitch. So... That could be a very effective pitch. The problem is you don't want to start it inside and let it move out over the plate. Well, here's Paul O'Neill, and he has really revved it up on this homestand. It's a drive fouled on the left field line, and it is 0-1. O'Neill had a three-homer game with eight RBIs here one night, and on the homestand, he has 19 runs batted in. Yeah. He's in the playoffs in New York. He's excited about it. Big crowds here this weekend. Now, that's the second pitch of the inning. And it's going high and tight. O'Neill yells something at him also. O'Neill yells something at him. Now, watch. Well, we didn't get a chance to see the entire sequence, but he did yell at Hanson. Hanson just ignored him. Well, I, I, 
I think I know what he said, but <laughs> I read lips pretty well, but he didn't like it anyway. Two and two to O'Neill. Come on, share it with us. No, I don't think we can on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, Now, knock that off, you knucklehead. Yes. That'll do. Three and two the count to Paul O'Neill. Darryl oh. Strawberry would be next. We have seen Hansen miss up and in with the fastball that was supposed to be down and in with two hitters here. And that one goes right past Willie McGee. O'Neill can run for a while. O'Neill to second. O'Neill to third. And he'll pull up there with three bases. Well, McGee has played a lot of center field in his career. He has not played right field a lot. And the ball comes towards you differently in right field than it does anywhere else. Now, he should have caught this ball. Watch, he gets a good jump on it in. He's coming in right away. You see, he was running right away. He got a good jump. Ball is there, and now he just misjudges it. And the ball gets away from McGee because he actually slowed up a step or two before the ball got there, which tells me that he could have come hard a little one more step and got it. Well, here comes Daryl Strawberry. They're going to score that a triple for O'Neill. Very high ball one. Strawberry, who hit that three-run homer Friday against Tim Wakefield, had not been playing much before that. He had some back problems that had limited his uh, abilities. And also, he just has not been a guy who's played every day since he became a Yankee. Strawberry. He's playing in his 23rd game tonight. He's had 66 at bats, a 288 average, two homers. Well, his back is still bothering him a little bit, and actually the swing there tells you that it's bothering him a little bit. He did not stay in there. He started his swing, and then he wanted to look like he wanted to get the pressure off of his back. So his back is still bothering him just a little bit. Runner at third, two down. That's a long one. Strawberry has done it again. Two nothing, New York. Most of the time when you have an injury, it only hurts you when you swing and miss. The way to solve that, make contact. And this pitch was up and out over the plate where Darrell likes it. He likes the ball out over the plate, and he drove it out of the ballpark. Now Deion James comes up. It's a little bit low, apparently. Deion James has had a hot bat. 321 average. Two homers and 22 batted in. him up third baseman Naring in the foul ground and that is the inning but a ball that should have been caught that went for a triple and then Daryl Strawberry boom in amongst the spectators two nothing Yanks with Canseco coming up when we return to Yankee Stadium after these words Daryl Strawberry a two run homer for the New York Yankees against that man, Eric Hansen. They talk about Will Clark having a beautiful swing. There's none better and more beautiful than Daryl Strawberry when he makes contact like that. Now watch this swing. Here's the pitch. It's a fastball. It's middle of the plate in and up a little bit. Now watch this swing. I mean, it's just beautiful. He's got a long, flowing swing. When he's in a groove, there's nothing pretty. Jose Canseco. And he takes a strike. And you contrast Daryl Strawberry's beautiful extension with Canseco, who is more of a brute strength, raw, raw swing. So it's a lot, they're a lot different. They get the job accomplished about the same, but they're different. <laughs> Sterling Hitchcock pops in the breaking ball. 0 2 the count. Canseco hitting 312, 22 homers in only 330 at bats. That's one for every 15 at bats. And 68 runs batted in. But most of those home runs have been coming lately. He struck him out. And you can see Canseco motion that the ball was up. Yes, it was, but the reason he swung at it is because he had two strikes. 
And I keep pointing out, if Hitchcock can stay ahead of the hitters, he can get them to chase pitches out of the strike zone. We've seen him get them to chase a fastball up here by Canseco, and we also saw Valentin swing at a breaking ball in the dirt. If he stays ahead, he can continue to get those kind of swings. This is Tim Naring. Naring, a right-handed hitter, as you see. 317 batting average. Nine homers and 53 batted in. It's a strike call to the outside. One ball and one strike. Andy Pettit, the young Yankee left-hander, who pitched here yesterday, just shut down the Red Sox. And there are a lot of similarities between Pettit and Hitchcock. Pettit, though, has become a much more consistent this year than has Hitchcock. Hitchcock will still have a good one and a couple of bad ones and be in and out. I think Pettit has a little better breaking ball and a little better command of the breaking ball also. Two and two now. Here's Andy Pettit. His win here yesterday uh, ran his record to nine and eight. Yankees are, well, trying to get into the postseason, also in a bit of a rebuilding mode. A couple of young starting pitchers that they've worked into the rotation. Right to the third baseman, Barnes. And that is out number two. Naring retired. Boggs throwing out the man who eventually ended up replacing him in Boston at third base. Scott Cooper, the first man to replace him, now in St. Louis. And now Naring has taken over there. Naring's had a good year, hit the ball well. Two down, here's Mike Greenwell. Well, John, the Red Sox are in a similar situation we talked about the first two ball games. Are they fallen behind? And earlier in the year, they were always fighting back and bouncing back. And this is another good test for them to see that, hey, to show themselves, hey, we've got to kick it in here and keep it going. The Cleveland Indians have kept theirs going even though they've had a big lead. I think the Red Sox are going to have to kind of wake up a little bit and say we're going to have to finish the season very hot. Cleveland won again today. They clinched the Central Division title on Friday against Baltimore. And boy, I was in Cleveland for Joe and that town celebrated. It was like uh, it was as if the war had ended and people were beeping their horns. It was just quite a night in Cleveland. Greenwell on the breaking ball has a base hit. First hit for the Red Sox. Yeah, the second time Greenwell has had a hit against Hitchcock in 11 career at bats. Well he hadn't been getting many pitches like that. That was a breaking ball that was right in the middle of the plate. Didn't do a lot. And if you throw Greenwell pitches like that, he is going to hit it hard. It's a matter of whether they catch it. Now watch this pitch. It hangs up right there, breaking ball right in the middle of the plate, and he lined it to left field for a base hit. But he's a good hitter, so you make a mistake, he makes you pay. Here is Mike McFarland. Well, Kevin Kennedy, talking to us before the game, remarked that in that stretch in August when they were just unbeatable, he said every night it seemed like the starting pitcher for the Red Sox shut out the opposing team early in the game. Right. The Red Sox never had to come from behind in the ball game. And you know, what he's concerned with this weekend is that both Friday and again yesterday afternoon the Yankees went ahead early and then he just didn't see that same fight in his ball club that he'd been seeing all year long. And, and truly at this point there's not a whole lot of stake for the Red Sox. They're 13 and a half ahead with about 20 games to go. They know they're going into October baseball. But it's always a manager's worst nightmare to have a, an outstanding club. And then three or four weeks before the, the postseason, the club starts getting listless because there's not much of a challenge left for them. But I mean, this is not kind of the, the kind of a game you can just turn on and off, right, Joe? I mean, no, it's, uh, it's human nature, though, John. If you have a big lead, you know, to kind of want to relax a little bit. I mean, that's just human nature. So you have to keep pushing yourself. That's what the manager's job is. That's, that's, that's where the manager comes in. The manager does not win as many games as people think that he does by strategy but he can win a lot of ball games by keeping his team ready to play and preparing them to play before the game starts. Kevin Kennedy that's Johnny Pesky longtime Red Sox sitting alongside too high to McFarland and the fact that he did say that that is a concern of his tells me that he's going to address it with him and he knows where the problem lies and, and he will address it. Mike McFarland, by the way, his wife, Allie, or rather his wife, Kathleen, delivered their third child, whose name is Allie, yesterday. Baby girl. So congratulations to 
Mike and his wife Kathleen on the birth of their third child, Allie. Allie McFarland, nice name. Three and two to Mike McFarland. Over first base, there is Greenwell with two down. Yankees lead the Red Sox, two nothing. Mattingly playing right in front of Greenwell at first base. There goes Greenwell. Swing and a miss, strike three. Three strikeouts for Hitchcock already. Mattingly will be coming up when we get back. Two nothing, New York. Baseball studios, I'm Carl Ravitch. The team the Yanks are chasing as far as the wild card goes, the Mariners. MCI proof positive for the Kingdom. Bottom eight, 4-4, four, four, Joey Cora against Greg Olson. Oh, and he real. gets all he needs, a double. It brings in Vince Coleman, and it gives the Mariners a 5-4 win. They sweep Kansas City. Game still going on right now. The Twins over the Angels, 9-8. Pat Mahomes in. It is now just gone final. Final score, the Twins over the Angels by a final score of 9-8. Back to the Bronx. Thank you, Carl. And here comes Don Mattingly. Mattingly will be followed by Stanley and then Fernandez. 2 0, New York ahead. Hanson misses ball one. Mattingly hitting 281, six homers, 41 RBIs. And the question, of course, is will Mattingly be back with the Yankees next year? That's too high, ball two. And Buck Showalter says that even when Mattingly is not producing the runs the way he used to. That one's a foul out play. That Mattingly still means a lot to this ball club in terms of his great defense at first base. He's still outstanding over there, but he says also Mattingly is the leader on this ball club. So when Mattingly does something in a ball game, he says you can feel the energy on the ball club. That is dropped by Greenwell. Mattingly is safe, and the Red Sox outfield is having some problems tonight. Well, it's the way it has been all year long, John. Not a good defensive ball club, as we said at the top of the show. Uh, that ball, again, should have been caught. We don't know. We'll see how they scored, but the ball definitely should have been caught. Mattingly hits it hard, no doubt about it, but you see Greenwell gets there in plenty of time. He doesn't have to slide, but he does, and he hits off his bare hand and not in the glove. And... They scored as an error. Rightfully so. So Mattingly is aboard. Here's Mike Stanley. Ball one. Stanley is hitting 282. 18 homers and 79 runs batted in. Second in the club and runs batted in. John, I want to address the Mattingly situation here in between pitches because I, I think it's important to look at. One ball, no strikes. And ball two. And I think it's important because now his leadership, I think that's very, very valuable. His defense is also valuable. But a first baseman's job is to drive in runs and to produce runs. I think his leadership role on this ball club is the most important thing that he's doing right now. In the left center field, base hit. Mattingly is going to try for third. Here comes Greenwell. Throw. Going to be close. And he is out. And it wasn't that close. He was out by plenty. Yeah, it was going to be close, John. He stumbled about halfway between second and third, and that's the reason he was out. He made up his mind he was going to go, and then he took another look, and for some reason, you know, he may have hit a soft patch out there or whatever, but he stumbled, and that's the reason he was out. Now, take a look at him when he rounds second base. Right now, he says, I'm going. See, right there, he stumbles, and that takes away a couple of steps. It would have been a lot closer had he not stumbled rounding second base. But it's also, you have to give credit to the outfield. That's a perfect throw, one hopper right to the second, third baseman. Mike Greenwell gets the assist, so the man that he allowed to reach on the error, he has cut down. Stanley the second on the throw after his single. Tony Fernandez, the hitter, with one out and a runner at second. Yanks leading 2-0. The veteran Tony Fernandez, 251 batting average. Hit for the cycle here the other night. You show Walter also, he talks about Mattingly. He says he's the leader in this ball club. Right. He says sometimes you can get through to a player with, with peer pressure. And that's the most effective way. He says as Mattingly's a guy, if he says something to a ball player, well, that hits home because Mattingly has that kind of authority with his teammates as a member of the Yankees here. So, you know, Showalter just points to a lot of those kind of uh, things that don't show up in the batting averages, the RBI columns. And 
you know, so I think it brings up some good points. I mean, Mattingly has been a, such a, a key member of this ball club for so many years. I mean, should the Yankees let him go or should they want him to stay here? Hanson with the swinging strike by Fernandez, two and two. Uh, there's no doubt in, in my mind that I'm probably the biggest Don Mattingly fan, maybe even in the ballpark, because I've watched him throughout his career and he's carried himself with dignity and he's been a class act. Here's that curveball. Tough play for Velarde. Not Velarde. That's Velarde's with the Yankees. Ali Sayan. Nice play by Ali Sayan. And Fernandez is retired as Stanley takes third. Two down, and here is, uh, in fact, Randy Velarde. Out in the Monument Park here between the bullpens in left center. There's the monument to Lou Gehrig, a man, a gentleman, and a great ball player whose amazing record of 2,130 consecutive games should stand for all time. A tribute from the Yankee players. And of course, the record stood for 56 years, and we saw it broken the other night by Cal Ripken. It was a poignant moment after that ball game, the ceremonies at Camden Yards, when Lou Gehrig's former teammate, the man who played with him, who was there when the streak ended and was there for that famous day, Lou Gehrig Day on the 4th of July, 1939, in this ballpark. Joe DiMaggio was introduced, and he came out of the field to salute Cal Ripken. Some of the others with the plaques out there, the Miller Huggins, the great manager of the Murderer's Road team, the Babe. The Yankees, of course, have had that storied history in this historic ballpark with some of the greatest players who have ever played the game. Played right here. One and one to Velarde. He fouls one back. One ball and two strikes. And speaking of DiMaggio, there's the plaque to the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio. 56 consecutive games. Now there's a record that may not be broken. Pete Rose came the closest. Ball and two strikes. But Joe, you're, you're talking about Mattingly. Well, I, I, I mean, like I said, I'm a big fan of his, but John, there comes a point in every player's career when you say, well, is he valuable enough that he needs to start every day? Now, that's the point I'm making. He is valuable enough to be on any ball club, but the question is, is he valuable enough as a hitter now to play every single day? Or does he become a platoon player? But even with that aside, it has his position with the Yankees over the years, the kind of ball player he's been for them, the kind of career he's had as a Yankee, does that merit the Yankees showing him the respect of, of offering him a contract, whether they offer him the chance to play every day in the future or not? I mean, should they go out and say, we appreciate what you've done here. We want you to stay with us. Here's another one-year offer. And then leave it up to Mattingly, for Mattingly to say yes or no. Gene Michael, general manager. Yeah. In the right field by Velarde. That's a base hit, a two-out RBI single. Stanley scores, and it is 3-0 New York. Well, that's the reason Velarde is playing almost every day is because he has been hitting well and hitting in the clutch. And here's another example of that. Two-strike, fastball again. Miller to play it in and up a little bit. And he takes it to right field for a base hit. Good hitting there with two strikes. Lead off man Wade Boggs now. Strike one call. Again, I'm a big Don Magley fan, and I think he belongs with the Yankees. But again, the question is whether he can be an everyday player anymore. You know, maybe he needs to play four days, take a day off, play three days, take a day off. I, maybe that's the situation, and that would help him produce better. Well, for instance, and maybe I'm off base here, but yeah. just as a for instance, for the sake of argument, Yastrzemski in his later years with the Red Sox. Right. Now, he was a legendary figure for the Red Sox. He had, had a great career. Now, in his later years, he was mostly a designated hitter, and he was a platoon player, almost exclusively facing right-handed pitching. But there was never a question from one year to the next that they were going to offer him another contract for the following year. Well, that's the point I'm making. I mean... I I think he should be remain with the Yankees, but maybe he needs to be, I won't say a platoon player, because I don't think that's 
I don't like that term, first of all, but a, a, but not an everyday player. You know, I mean, a platoon player means that he's it's always dictated by a right hander or a left hander. I think it should be dictated by how he's swinging the bat. If he's swinging the bat well, he'll hit left handers also. But if he's not, then you take him out for a couple of days and then insert him back in. Don't let him just stay in a rut. So, and having said that, are you saying that you agree that because he's Don Mattingly, and right. who Don Mattingly is as a Yankee, that he deserves to be offered some kind of a contract? Yeah, I said I think he still belongs with yeah. the Yankees. There's okay. no doubt in my mind about that. And that's a call strike. Two balls, two strikes to Wade Boggs. But again, there comes a time when you have to decide when you can't be an everyday player anymore. Do you want to keep playing? As your Smith had to decide, he made the proper decision, I think, where he did keep playing. He continued to play as not, you know, a strictly everyday player. Now, as you write, Mattingly needs to make that same decision. Everyone has to make that decision at one time in their life. And not to put it in, make it personal, but I decided I couldn't be you know, a platoon player and a guy to sit on the bench. So the decision was I had to retire because it had come time for me not to be an everyday player anymore. So you have to make that decision at some time in your career. Yeah. And, and I think, think that time has come for Mattingly to make that decision one way or the other. And right. if he feels he can play every day, then he needs, he will have to go someplace else probably. Two and two the count. Ooh, very close. Full count out of bars. With first base for Lottie with two down. He'll be off and running with his pitch. Mo Vaughn moves off the bag now. He'll play behind him over there. Three and two to Vaughn. There's Big Mo. Runner goes and it is too high. Two men on, two men out. Bernie Williams will be coming up. Don't forget now, next Sunday night, what a matchup. The Atlanta Braves. Fred McGriff, he's closing in on 30 home runs again. And many think that Barry Larkin of the Cincinnati Reds should be the MVP in the National League. Well, we'll see the Braves and the Reds from Cincinnati, the two top teams in the National League, maybe a preview of the National League Championship Series. And here's Bernie Williams. Struck out looking his first time. Two on, two out. Along the left field line. It's fair, it's trouble. It is a fair ball. It's rattling around. Scoring Velarde. Here comes Boggs, the relay. Boggs scores a double for Williams. Five to nothing, New York. And again, we need to point back that this inning was started by an error on the left fielder. As we take a look at Bernie Williams, the ball's out over the plate. He kind of slices it down the left field line. No chance for Greenwell to make a play on this ball. That was just a double all the way. And two run score. But the runs are unearned because there should have been three outs already in the end. Here's O'Neill. You're right, John. Should have told me that on there, but they threw the Mattingly out at third base. So since uh, that the man who got out of the air got thrown out of the base pads, it's then okay. It's the, uh, yeah, the yeah. runs end up being earned. Yeah. Here's Vaughn Eshelman up in the Red Sox bullpen, the left-hander. But still, in all, we don't know that Stanley, the next batter, yeah, would have gotten a base hit. Well, you always you put your pitcher in the been, stretch. Yeah, he was in the stretch. It was a different situation. Paul O'Neill. Who won the batting champion last uh, cha batting championship last year in the strike shortened season? Just having a great year. And on this homestand, he has been swinging the bat the way he did swing it much of last year. Three and one. Has the 53rd pitch thrown in this game by Hansen already. And the Yankees, man, you'd think the Yankees were the team heading for. Uh, the division title here, the way they pounded the Red Sox this weekend. Two, three, and two. They had scored 17 runs in the first two games of this series, and they have five on the board already tonight. We're only in the second inning. And you know, want to take a look at the National League, though. The Reds had a big lead. They went into Colorado, and they were swept this weekend. So teams with big leads have to watch out. Yeah. 
Just got a piece of it. Foul ball, three and two. How about the California Angels? Right. When they, the, the only the Cleveland Indians have been able to continue at the pace they were playing before they felt like they had it wrapped up. You see, the Angels, in fact, with that loss today, I mean, two weeks ago, it looked like that was all over. The American League West. And the Seattle Mariners are now just five games behind them. Struck him out with a changeup. Nice pitch. So O'Neill goes down, but the Yankees get three more. Five to nothing. From New York, New York. Sunday night baseball, Yanks five, Red Sox nothing. I'm John Miller along with Joe Morgan and uh, here at the big ballpark in the Bronx. Now, meanwhile, next week, we are going to see the, the Braves and the Reds. And Joe, uh, we're starting to kind of put together these postseason series now. And of course, if the Yankees are in it, that means that the Yankees have to face, uh, face California and the Red Sox have to face Cleveland the first round. So some tough first round series uh, right there for a club that won a title. Well, I think what everyone wants to avoid is the Cleveland Indians in the first round if you can help it. So I think the Boston Red Sox are going to have to help keep these Yankees out of this pennant race. Yeah. There's Lee Tinsley. <laughs> The Red Sox have had that history dating back to the sale of Babe Ruth to the Yankees where the Yankees have won so many titles and the Red Sox have not won any since then and well it could be kind of exciting on the one hand to see the Yankees and Red Sox in that final best of seven. Yeah that's obviously some Yankee fan trying to rub it in. <laughs> And of course, the Bambino. He became the Bambino after he came to New York. But I mean, would it be some kind of incredible for the Red Sox, who are currently leading the Yankees by 13 and a half games, to have to face them in the League Championship Series to get to the World Series after they trounced them in the regular season? Two and one to Lee Tinsley. Nice change of speeds there by Hitchcock. He's got a five run lead with which to work here. Lee Tinsley coming back from a stomach muscle pull that had him on the disabled list. Hitting 293. He's been a big man for the Red Sox this year. Hitchcock has four strikeouts now. Any pitcher would rather pitch from in front of the count, but I think it's even more imperative if you're left handed, you don't have an overpowering fastball. You see him chase the breaking ball again. All of his strikeouts have been on pitches that are out of the strike zone. You see that spin on the breaking ball going down and in on the right hander. Here is Luis Alisea, the former Cardinal. It's a high foul out of play into the upper deck. Off to the right. Cleveland is now 51 games over 500 and yet with a 25 and a half game lead over the Kansas City Royals it's not likely but it's still possible that at some point in the postseason Cleveland would have to face Kansas City in a best of seven series which well, let's put it this way if you've been able to beat them by 25 games you should be able to beat them four out of seven in a series I think the difficult part to understand John is in my opinion, both series should be four out of seven. Fernandez in the hole. Safe at first base. Alicea beat it out. Well, Tony Fernandez does not have a gun from the hole. And he goes in the hole, and he doesn't have the real strong arm of your normal shortstop. Now watch how long it takes this ball to get over there. He straightens up and fires. He actually comes over the top on that. But you can see not a lot on that ball and Alisea beats it out. Second hit for Boston. Here is Willie McGee hitting lead off. He grounded a short his first time. Five to nothing. The Yanks are leading the Red Sox. Caught by Fernandez. No throw. Back to first is Alisea. Two men down now for an update. Here's Carl Ravage. Thank you, John. You talked about the Indians in first place and still playing well. What about the Braves over in the National League? After an hour and 41-minute rain delay, Mike Devereaux scores Ed Giovanola. That made it 3-2. Braves are now in the top of the fourth. Maddox started this game, but after the delay, did not return. We return to New York. Here is John Valentin. Struck out his first time. 
Mike Devereaux with Baltimore in the last few years started this year with the White Sox and was just picked up by the Braves to give them a little better depth off the bench because they got all of that left handed power and Devereaux pretty good right handed hitter was hitting over 300 with the White Sox still hit some homers runs well and is an excellent outfielder so you have to like that uh, Braves depth a little bit better now than in the last couple of years with a guy like Devereaux added to the mix the Braves you know their pitching is better but most of their power as you said was from the left side so Devereaux may play a big role in their playoff chance. John Valentin Boggs over to Velarde at second for the four side on LSA and that's the inning. Darryl Strawberry will be coming up when we get back 5 nothing New York. Well, Strawberry he's been uh, providing some first inning thunder this weekend for the New York Yankees Friday night against Tim Wakefield with two men on. He crushed one. He knew it was gone. It hit off that advertising panel in the third deck. Then tonight one man on. Not quite as deep but still just as effective. Another home run for Strawberry his second of the weekend. And here he is leading it off against Hanson in the third. Chase that change up didn't get it on one. So Strawberry now with three homers in 67 at bats. All of a sudden those numbers looking more strawberry like one ball and one strike to strawberry and of course in his big days with the Mets I mean he was a guy who could hit six or seven home runs in uh, five or six days to carry a club for a while he cracks that one but there was Vaughn right on the line and that's why one away well they made a conscious effort to pitch him inside because Darrell likes the ball out over the plate where he can extend his arms and, and drive the ball. So the first two pitches were inside. And this one, as you see the target inside, it's in also. Hits it hard, but he hits it on the ground to first base because he can't extend as well as he did in the first inning. Deion James, the hitter. Fouled out to third his first time. Ball one. Five to nothing. Yankees leading the Red Sox. Now, one thing, too, about this Red Sox team only the Angels and the Indians have outscored the Red Sox in all of Major League Baseball uh, excepting any team that has its home games in Denver. Hits <laughs> <laughs> that one hard started to sinking but McGee was able to handle it out number two. We talked about the fact that McGee you know is normally a center fielder or a left fielder. He's playing pretty deep in right field for a short ballpark. When the fence is close, you don't have to play deep because they hit it well. It's going over your head anyway. So he ends up fighting some of these short balls, the balls that don't carry all the way out there. It's like playing in the Fenway Park. You don't play back against the wall. You play shallow. Here's Mattingly. He was safe on the error by Greenwell his first time. Five to nothing. The Yankees lead the Red Sox. Last of the third. This is the latest renewal of this ancient and hostile rivalry between these two ball clubs. And it's foul out of play off to the left. Mattingly, of course, back in the 80s, won a batting championship. I mean, he had some years. Look at that, that four-year period. His average year was 121 RBIs at a 337 average. Back to the shortstop. Valentin throws out Mattingly, and it's an easy inning for Hansen for the first time tonight. We head to the fourth. The power's coming up. Vaughn and then Canseco. Yanks as Mo Vaughn leads it off here in the fourth inning. Mo grew up in Connecticut as a Yankee fan. We asked him what it means to him to play here at the big ballpark. All those uh, great teams with Munson and Chandler and Mattingly and Randolph and Danton Nettles and Reggie. You know, you, you don't forget that. It's uh, nice to go home and, and play in New York. Uh, I figure that because any time to have a big day is there. You know, that's, the, that's the capital. You know, to me, uh, if you want to go out and have success and, and keep moments, you want to have it in Yankee Stadium. Well, Big Mo hitting the first pitch just barely fair, and it somehow went over to the uh, box seat railing down the right field line and stuck. Mattingly had to go chase it. And Mo, as he just told us, of course, very happy to hit a double here at Yankee Stadium in front of the hometown fans. Well, that pitch is down and in where left-handers like it. And Mo belted it right down the line. We'll see it. Well, it just kind of hit off the railing and stopped as he mitts down the right field line. Now Mattingly's the closest defensive player to it, so he runs down and picks it up. 
Yankee Stadium. Now there's a lot of foul territory behind home plate at Yankee Stadium. But along the lines there's very little foul territory. Here is Canseco. Very slowly to short. Fernandez. Got it. Canseco who struck out his first time is now 0 for 2. Now you see that foul territory. You see how the stands pull right out next to the foul line and they go the last oh, maybe 100 feet or so down each line right along that foul line. So a lot of good sight lines for the fans and not much foul territory except behind the plate. Same thing down the left field line here. Much like Fenway Park in that regard. Stands are very close. Here is Tim Nary. Down to the third is first time. Strike call on the outside. And I feel like I know the answer to this already, Joe, but I'm just going to put it to you. I mean, are you surprised that Vaughn didn't go to third base on that little slow roller to short? I, I think he was anticipating Canseco doing more with the pitch than that, and he's down five to nothing, so he didn't want to take any chances, but you're right, he could have made it easily. That's foul down the left field line. But by the same token, you do not want anything to happen to you when your five runs down. You do not want to make any base running mistakes. See, so sometimes I, you are a little more cautious. I had anticipated that you would say all of those things. <laughs> just as I thought, Joe. It's a beautiful view there, isn't it? From out beyond the uh, famed Yankee Stadium facade, which now borders the outfield panels above the bleachers. Two strikes to Nary. Check swing. The appeal to Larry Barnett denied. Larry Barnett, he was the man who worked behind home plate Wednesday. Camden Yards, Baltimore for the historic night. As Cal Ripken broke Gehrig's record and he had requested that he be allowed to to work behind the plate that night. He felt that that would be perhaps the greatest night in his career. Something to remember. He's remembered for some other things. Well, things maybe that he doesn't want to be remembered <laughs> for. <laughs> Red Sox fans remember him. Well, I, well, yeah, he made the right call, so he's remembered for making the proper call in the World Series oh, between the Reds and the uh, that's right. Red Sox when Arm Brewster bunted the ball and Carlton Fist threw it away in the center field. Let it wasn't be. it wasn't Arm Brewster's fault. He didn't interfere, so he let made me. the proper call, and that's a great call. Well, let me say, Red so Reds fans and Red Sox fans both remember him, but for they remember him in, in vastly different ways. I, well, I understand that, but he made the proper call. Not if we're sitting in New Hampshire. <laughs> Here's Mike Greenwell. He singled his first time in the left field. Runner in second. Mo Vaughn. Sox are down five nothing. They've got a great chance here to cut into that lead a little bit, but they've not been able to move Mo up at all here since his leadoff double. But Larry Barnett. You know, it's interesting to, to get that little glimpse at an umpire's uh, career and and see the the feel they have for the game because Barnett was talking about Lee Wire worked the plate the night Pete Rose broke Ty Cobb's hits record right and he felt that that was a, a feather in Lee Wire's cap a night for Lee Wire to always remember it was, uh, was it Satch Davidson worked behind the plate in game six of the 75 World Series when Fisk hit the, the dramatic home run in the the tenth inning I can't I can't remember for sure that it was John, the only thing I can remember about that is it made us play one more day I can't remember who was behind you. Just, you just remember Dwight <laughs> Evans' catch. That's what you remember. You got robbed. I definitely got robbed. Joe was, he went to the clubhouse after that game and said, call the cops. I got robbed. But looking back, I'm glad he caught it. Because it made a more historic event when Carlton Fisk hits his home run and then we win the next day. Well, that, that's pretty good. I, I, I like your uh, yeah. appreciation of, of seeing the, the, the large picture. Because you know you got robbed. Right. One and two the count. And it's a foul off to the left. Let's I, see, I guess the, wait, wait, wait. Game seven. It's coming back to me now. Game seven. Let's see. We tie blew him out. Game, I think. Tie ball game. And then Joe Morgan came up and right. singled home the winning. Yeah, run. I think we. With the, I thought we blew him out though in the seventh game. No, you're right. It was a close game. <laughs> One ball and two strikes to Mike Greenwell. Well, of course, was there in the series of 86 when the Red Sox. Well, it was not a happy ending. It was not a happy ending. And especially the way that 
I guess game six ended made it even tougher to handle since they were a couple outs away from winning and then down to one out down to one strike. You know the guy who won game six for the Mets is in the ballpark tonight. Yeah. But he is on their side. He's with the Red Sox. That's right. Two and two the count to Greenwell. Two down. Three and two. Mike McFarlane a right handed hitter is on deck with some power by the way. So Hitchcock needs to get a strike in here to Greenwell with a five run lead. He cannot afford to walk in. There's Vaughn at second base. Three called and Greenwell can't believe it. Five strikeouts and Greenwell really getting into it with Clark. Five nothing Yankees. We go to the last of the fourth. And they're still going. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball from New York. Five to nothing. The Yankees lead the Red Sox. Last of the fourth. And let's take a look at this pitch to Greenwell. Greenwell thinks it's inside, but I guess the point is there's a short right field fence here in Yankee Stadium, and if a left-hander throws your ball inside, you want to pull it. It gives you a better chance of getting your team back in the ball game. Walk's not going to help you a lot there unless the next guy hits a home run. Here's Mike Stanley, who singled his first time, and he takes ball one. Now, Joe, I want you to show me what could be done with a pitch like that. Well, something like this, it's caught by McGee on the warning track. I mean, that's what you're talking about. Yes, right? I mean it's a short, it's a short right field wall here, and I, I guess my point is, and it's easy for me to say because I'm standing up here, I don't think the ball, I wasn't hitting, and the ball's inside. But we'll take a look at Stanley, who takes a shot at right field. This is a small ballpark. Anything straight away and down the line, the ball will go out, and the. Boston Red Sox are trailing five to nothing. You're in a position now where you need to get two or three runs with one swing, and that's that's what they have guys that can do. Ken Seiko, of course, is able to do it. Greenwell, all these guys are able to hit the ball out of the ballpark. Here's Tony Fernandez. He grounded out his first time. Of course, in Fenway, that right field area, that's the big part of the ballpark. Yeah. Tougher to hit it out straight away right field Fenway. A left-handed hitter gets rewarded at Fenway if he takes the ball to left field, as many lefties have done over the years. One strike to count to Fernandez. Eric Hansen still out there for the Red Sox. Has the curveball there and misses with it. One ball and one strike. Johnny Pesky. Yeah. Now that right field pole, you know, Pesky didn't have much power, but the foul pole at Fenway is only 302 feet away from home plate. And a couple times every year he'd hit a home run. It always seemed to wrap around that pole. So when he played with the Red Sox, they dubbed it Pesky's pole. Jose Canseco, he doesn't care anything at all about that. <laughs> hey, he can hit it out of any ballpark in any direction. Canseco's more interested in that uh, roof across the street <laughs> yeah. behind the left field wall. <laughs> two and two now, the count to Fernandez. Well, Hansen has won 13 games for the Red Sox this year. What a pickup, 13 and 4. And a lot of times the Red Sox helped him out a little bit and scored some runs. So they are well capable of scoring runs in bunches. This is the highest scoring Red Sox team. I mean, assuming that they, they continue to score at the rate they've been scoring all year, this would be their highest scoring team since 1950. And that was a Red Sox team that hit over 300 as a team. Hansen got it. And Fernandez is retired. Nice play there by Hanson. That ball was going to be a very difficult play for Alisea at second base if he was if he would have been able to get to it. But good fielding here by Hanson. Now watch, you see Alisea over to the right. He's not going to be able to get this ball. It's going to be a base hit to center field. Hanson knocks it down, picks it up, and throws him out. Nice play. Two down, Randy Velarde, the hitter. Velarde singled his first time and scored a run. Strike in the outside. It's 0-1. John Watson Hanson. He's throwing the ball well. His changeup is working, and his fastball. But we talked about him having a great curveball. He has not thrown that many curveballs. They feel like his arm is okay to throw the curveball. There's, There's one right there. <laughs> Got to hit hard, but right 
to Nary. And it's another quiet inning. Three up and three down. We're heading to the fifth inning now. McFarland will come up. 5-0 Yankees over the Red Sox. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Top of the fifth inning coming. 5-0 Yankees here over the Red Sox. John, when Eric Hansen was with Seattle, he had a great curveball. We're going to take a look at him throwing it when he's with Seattle. This is Harold Baines taking a look, swinging over the top of one. There's Ruben Sierra yeah. taking it for strike three. And his curveball we've seen him throw tonight is not quite as sharp because he doesn't have the same velocity on it. McFarland taking strike one. Well, let's take a look at it. Well, this one you'll see, even though it's going to be in super slow motion, you're not going to you're going to see the spin on it, but it doesn't break quite as sharply as the other ones were breaking. And I think that's because he's not throwing it quite as hard, and he doesn't have the feel for his curveball. It's not that his arm is bothering him to keep it from throwing it, but he doesn't have the feel for it yet because he hasn't been throwing it all year. So now he's trying to throw it, and he just doesn't have the feel for it yet. It's going to take him a little while longer. He's got great stuff going tonight. He's got that fork ball he throws as well. And now he has six strikeouts, including McFarland, both times. But well, remember, I, I pointed it out earlier, he has not gotten a strikeout on any strike. They're all bad pitches out of the strike zone because he's staying ahead of the hitters and they're chasing that breaking ball out of the strike zone or the fastball up and out of the strike zone or the fork ball in the dirt. So that's what he's doing properly tonight. He's staying ahead. Tinsley Tinsley loves the bunt, takes a strike. Tinsley struck out his first time. Now, Hitchcock staked to a nice lead in the very first inning. That's got to be part of the reason for his success, right? I mean, he can't help but be a little more confident with a big lead. Well, it definitely takes a lot of pressure off you. You know that the Red Sox are capable of scoring a lot of runs. So when you get five, I mean, you're, it takes a lot of the pressure off of you. As a pitcher. In the left center field, it's Death Valley here at Yankee Stadium. Look at that 399 marker. It's the deepest left center field in any ballpark. Join ESPN Thursday night for college football and oh boy! Texas Christian visits the, uh, visits the Kansas Jayhawks. The Jayhawks extended their record to 2-0 yesterday, while TCU, the Horned Frogs, won their opener. Coverage begins with a weekend kickoff show at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, and then at 8 Eastern, it's TCU and Kansas on ESPN. Did that kind of get you pumped up? I'm, I'm ready to go. You know, I've been driving to L.A. and Anaheim to do to watch those Wednesday games. I yeah. might drive down and watch the TCU play their ball game. One ball and no strikes to Luis Alice. And now one and one. Alice got an infield hit his first time. He beat out a little bouncer into the hole at short. John, as a kid, I, you know, collected frogs, but what is a horned frog? Come on, you're from Texas. Curveball just foul on the first base side. One or two. That's why I asked you. <laughs> what is a horned frog, though? It's a frog that has little horns on it. Oh. What oh, were you born yesterday? <laughs> well, I mean, I've, I've never actually seen one. My chemistry class, they didn't have horns on it. Oh, them. come on. You mean your biology class? You're right, biology. See? <laughs> there you go. It's born yesterday. <laughs> You're right, because chemistry I blew up the lab. <laughs> Check swing foul off to the right. Two and two. The count to Luis Alisea. TCU's colors are purple and white. I've so seen them play. If you ever see a frog that has those colors, you'll know that that's a horned frog. That's a horned frog. frog. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Two and two the count. Swung on and missed, but that ball gets away from Stanley. <laughs> it gets about 90 feet away from him and easily to the first base goes Luis Alisea, a strikeout and a wild pitch. Very wild. Well, that's exactly what he's been doing the entire ball game. Get him to chase the balls out of the strike zone with two strikes. But this one gets away. It's a wild pitch as it bounces in the dirt and bounces off of Stanley by the time he chases it down Alice is already at first base but the pattern continues right now, Alice might go to second base that one that one can that was so far away seven strikeouts for Hitchcock here's Willie McGee the leadoff man ball one he has grounded a short line to short Hitchcock's career record 
for strikeouts. He is eight at the big league level. He has seven tonight in four and two third innings. Taken outside, the changeup missing. Two and zero oh to Willie McGee. I, I offhand cannot remember another two and zero oh count that Hitchcock has had tonight. He, he has not fallen behind very many hitters. You're right, but that's why he has the seven strikeouts. Marty Aronoff assures us that this is, in fact, his first 2 0 count of the game. Shallow center, Bernie Williams in, Velarde out. Williams makes the catch. We're halfway through it. Wade Boggs, then Bernie Williams and Paul O'Neill coming up. Yankees 5, Red Sox nothing. Hello, Joe Morgan back at Yankee Stadium, New York. Yankees five, Red Sox nothing. Last of the fifth, the top of the order coming up for the Yanks. Wade Boggs is grounded out and walked and scored a run. Faces Eric Hansen. Oakland sinking a changeup low, ball one. Bernie Williams is on deck, and then Paul O'Neill. Those are the first three Yankee hitters due up here in the fifth. Left center field. Greenwell, one away. Let's take a look at Willie McGee. He had the first 2 0 count that Hitchcock has had in this ball game. And instead of you know, maybe waiting for a better pitch, he attacks right away because they've been falling behind and they've been striking out a lot on bad pitches. He pops this one up. And this is an excellent play by Bernie Williams. You see, he's going all out from the time the ball hit off the bat, gets there, makes a sliding catch, and the Red Sox are out. And Willie McGee back in right field. Having a possible bloop single taken away by this man, Bernie Williams. For the first time, really, Bernie started to become the player they thought that he, he could become. A 300 hitter, an outstanding center fielder, and a guy who hits with some power. And Bernie's got 16 homers, got nine triples, 21 doubles. Well, the Yankees have waited for him a long time. They've continued to say this guy's going to be a star. He's going to be a star. But I, I would also say I'm a little surprised at the power, but not at, at the speed, the defense, and the average. But I am a little surprised at the power. Well, most of his power is generated as a right-handed hitter. Right. He's averaging only one homer every 63 at-bats left-handed. But he's averaging one homer every 16 at-bats batting right handed so those are two different things entirely he's sort of like uh, Rod Carew what batting left handed and uh, batting right handed he's he's like Superman well that's a good point because if you watch him from the left side as, as I've seen him most of my it's, it's most of the bats I've seen him have are from the left side he just kind of lays the bat on the ball see how he just kind of throws the bat out there he's not really trying to drive the ball so to speak on the left side, he just kind of lays it out there on it, and he's had good results. Buck Showalter gave me a name tonight, Joe, and he says, do not forget this name. Ruben Rivera. We've read the name in the past. That's one of those little base hits into left field that he gets so often batting left-handed. Well, if, again, he just kind of throw, lays the bat on the ball out there and lines it to left field, but that's great hitting. Now watch, there's not much to this swing. Look at that, just kind of lays the bat out there. Now watch again, just lays it out there and goes to left field. See, there's not a lot to that. Not a lot of bat speed, not a lot of power generated, but it's a line drive to left field. Now, if he's ever going to become a, a true superstar and take advantage of this ballpark, he's going to have to uh, be able to eventually hit with some power left-handed because that's when you really can put some numbers up in this park as a left-handed hitter who hits with some power. Paul O'Neill knows all about that. Strike one to O'Neill tonight. He has hit a triple, although it was should have been an out, and it would have ended the first inning with nobody scoring. But it was misplayed by McGee in right field before Strawberry's home. And then he struck out his last time. 19 RBIs on his home stand for O'Neill. A strike from Hanson. 0 and 2 the count. Strawberry, by the way, is on deck. But uh, Ruben Rivera, he says he's already an outstanding outfielder. Great speed. He hits with power. He thinks he's going to hit for average. He's got a good arm. Change up. Got him. Well, he struck O'Neill out two times in a row now with the change up. 
And that is an excellent changeup. The last time he struck him out, it was a strike. This is not a strike. It starts in the strike zone and moves away, and you see O'Neill completely fooled by the pitch. There you see that is a great pitch there from Hanson. Back to the bag at first is Bernie Williams as Strawberry comes up. Let's see if they try to stay in tight on Strawberry as he did last time just to try to keep him from extending his arms. That's not the place you want to pitch him, I'll tell you that. When he first came up with the Mets, you threw a ball away, he'd line it over the left field wall. You throw it up and away, and he'd hit it over the center field wall. He really could generate a lot of bat speed on balls out over the plate or away from him. Remember, he's tall, he has long arms, and he has this long bat, so he can handle all the pitches away from him. They always try to time up inside when he's in the National League, right there. Two strikes. And you can see, because he is tall and has long arms, that pitch right there is more difficult for him to handle than the ball out over the plate. Williams back to the bag at first. Vaughn on the bag with him. Five to nothing. The Yankees leading the Red Sox in the last of the fifth inning. Ideally, John, you tr they would like to throw the fastball up and in. Well, it was a pretty sharp curveball, but it missed inside. If it hadn't have missed, he, he, he would have had him dead yes. to right. Well, that's where, yeah, again, you want to keep the ball in on if you can. That was a pretty good pitch there. I mean, pretty good breaking ball. Not that it was a strike, but it was a good breaking ball. But Strawberry wasn't swinging one way or the other. Right. He was <laughs> fooled on it. Well, he couldn't pick up the spin on it. To hit the curveball, you have to pick up the spin on the curveball. Fastball down and in. Two and two. I wonder if he came in with that changeup in that same spot this time now, Joe. Not that, that fool him? He's going to try to throw the changeup away if he can, but there he is. He's going away. And there's a little change of sinker away. Three and two. Well, the old Eric Hansen, the one that pitched for Seattle, would throw the yakka right here. He'd throw him a 3 2 curveball. Williams takes off. Changeup. And a walk for Strawberry. Well, he had him on to. The inning stays alive for Dion James. There's Kevin Kennedy. Al Nipper alongside there. Red Sox bullpen is busy. They're in the last of the fifth inning. Two on and two out. talked about the Red Sox not playing well here in Yankee State in the last two or three days but you know let's face it they are in a very enviable position in that you'd rather be in their position than the Yankees I mean I fly ball to left the bat of Deion James and Greenwell makes the grab by the way that was uh, Vaughn Eshelman in the bullpen out there but the inning is over it'll be Valentin Vaughn and Kansenko coming up the big ESPN Sunday Night Baseball from Yankee Stadium. Beneath the full moon, Yanks five, Red Sox nothing. We go to the sixth. Coming up, the Wednesday Night Baseball doubleheader. It'll be the Yankees and the Cleveland Indians who have already clinched a division title. Paul O'Neill and the Yanks go to Jacobs Field. Albert Bell and Eddie Murray, Carlos Baerga. What a lineup. What a ball club. 51 games over 500 right now. That's at 7.30, 4.30 Pacific. Then Kirby Puckett having a great year. The Twins and the Mariners. Edgar Martinez having an MVP type year. That's the second half of the doubleheader. And there's a base hit for John Valentin. First ball swinging against Sterling Hitchcock. Valentin on for the first time. And now Valentin, who's become a big power hitter in his own right, now with Mo Vaughn coming up, and then Canseco after him. You know, John... I would pay to see Kirby Puckett play. He's that good a player. And Edgar Martinez. So maybe I'll just, I can't drive to see that. You better just pot, take the yeah, shuttle up there. I think I'll just take the shuttle up yeah. and check him out next Wednesday. Man, Kirby has been he, hot. He has turned this into a, an outstanding year. He's hitting near 320. Got 90 RBIs. Speaking of big years, here's Mo Vaughn. He's been the man. You know, uh, Kevin Kennedy said that he has not called any team meetings this year, but 
couple of times lately he's felt that the team has needed to have a little sparklet under it. So he's gone to Mo. He says, Mo, can you kind of right. tell these guys that they ought to they're not playing as hard as maybe they, they should right now. And he said when Mo speaks, the Red Sox listen. And he is the leader, pure and simple in that Red Sox clubhouse. He says uh, Mike Greenwell has been a great leader for them and also Roger Clemens. But he says it kind of starts with Mo Vaughn. So on and off the field, Mo leading the Sox in their great year. That's a high drive into Death Valley, way back there, way back, way back. It is a home run! A left-handed batter. Homers over the 399 marker in left center. Unbelievable. Five to two for the Yankees. The 34th home run of the year for Mo. I mean, is this guy strong or what? Well, you called it Death Valley. Maybe he got on his mule team because that was a big league blast for a left-handed hitter. But Mo's big league player, too. We'll take a look at the pitch. And it's a high fastball, and I mean, he drives it right out over the 399-foot sign. Well, and that's what the Red Sox needed. Maybe that's what they need. You talk about Mo providing a spark. He just provided one for the Red Sox. There's another guy. You can hit him out there or anywhere. Strike one called to Kansenko. He seemed to think it was too low. Kansenko has struck out and grounded a short. Well, Sterling Hitchcock has given up a single and now a homer. Been touched up for the first time. Spike in the inside corner. Mo Vaughn, 34 homers and 109 runs batted in for the year now. Albert Bell and Edgar Martinez were tied for second at the start of the day with 105 runs batted in each. And Seiko high and deep into left center field. The outfielders are just watching. Where will it land? Goodbye. Bullpen shot. And that's where Buck Showalter is calling on the phone right now. Man. And then that ball traveled over the top of that full moon we saw earlier. And the Red Sox with their power on full display here in the house that Ruth built. Well, Mo Vaughn did provide the spark. Ken Seiko continues the fire. It's up a little bit, and when Canseco hits it, no one moves. I think that was the interesting thing. The outfielders just kind of looked at it. You see, they're not, they're just trying to see where it's going to land. They're not chasing wow. it. He almost got a pitcher in the bullpen, and there you see Hitchcock's reaction. Not many guys hit him that high and that deep. But you're talking about two pretty big fellows now, Canseco and Mo Vaughn. And they do swing big bats. They're not just swinging 31 ounce bats. Nardi Contreras, the Yankee pitching coach, out to the mound. There's a guy who used to hit him like that, Jim Rice. He's now the Red Sox hitting instructor. He hit some big flies. One year, in fact, he hit 46 of them. 1978, won the MVP in the American League. Tim Nairn, base hit. Man, they're going to. They're trying to get them all back at once here. They might do it. You're right. They have come alive here in Yankee Stadium. First hit for Naring. That's four straight hits. The battle will be Greenwell. And that right field porch is beckoning. And Greenwell is the possible tying run. And he's still upset about striking out his last at bat. So he's probably fired up a little bit here. Greenwell called out on strikes in the fourth. He singled the left in the second. In the Yankee bullpen, a right-handed warming up. The uh, young Yankee pitchers who ordinarily starts for them, or I mean, who is going to one day be a, a starter and a starter on occasion this year. That's Mariano Rivera, right-handed. Bearing back to the bag at first, Vaughn and Canseco with back-to-back -back home runs. I don't know which one was more impressive. It's Vaughn's has to be the more impressive. It, I guess. it was the most. As a lefty to go that. I don't know. I can't remember the seeing a lefty hit a home run in that part of this ballpark. Of course, uh, when the Babe yeah. played here in Gehrig, where it says 399 now, 
It said 457 half in those days. You had to hit him into the bleachers out there. I'll tell you another the reason. Okay. I'll tell you another reason Vaughn was more impressive because they were down five to nothing, and he put them on the board. He has been the guy that has led them all year, and now he's trying to lead them on a comeback. So another big hit from Mo Vaughn, followed by Ken Seiko. But Vaughn, I think, is the one that showed Hitchcock that they could put a chink in his armor. Until you score off of a pitcher, and he, he'll cruise along if he has a lead, he'll just continue to cruise. So you have to show him that you can score off of him. Greenwell right up the middle. Bellardi's got it. Nice play. Fernandez, two double play. And that is the biggest rally killer in baseball. Not the strikeout, but the ground ball up the middle. It turns into a four to six to three double play. But you have to give Hitchcock a little credit here, too. It's a fastball up. Nice play here by Velarde. He just tosses over. Fernandez comes across. And that is a four to six to three double play. That is a nice play there by Velarde. He just gives it to him in his glove with his glove. Perfect toss. And remember, the first throw is always the most important. Now here is McFarland. He struck out twice, and he takes ball one. Is he, is he taking a risk and making the throw that way? Well, yes, but I mean, you, if you practice it enough in, before the game, you know, before you, you know, take your ground balls, if you do that, it becomes like the second nature to you. Um, I mean, I'm guessing he just felt like he had to do it that way to make sure that... Well, he didn't, want to, yeah, he didn't want to take one more step with a left-handed hitter running. I don't think they like Boston here. It sounds like an anti-Boston yeah. chant, which yeah. has been off-chanted here at Yankee Stadium over the years. Three and one the count now to McFarland. It's great to see the Red Sox and Yankees both in a race where the fans care enough to, to hate each other so much. <laughs> it's great to see so much bad blood between the Sox and the Yankees again. The walk to McFarland. There's the look from uh, outside uh, Yankee Stadium. Beneath the full moon here in the Bronx. And up on the marquee, they pay tribute to one of the all-time great Yankees. Mickey Mantle, a Yankee forever. Here is Lee Tinsley. Curveball from Hitchcock spins in there for a strike. Tinsley has struck out and right out to left center. It was one of the, the great days in the history of this ballpark, and there have been a lot of them. Mickey Mantle day after he retired. with receiving the ovation of the huge crowd here in the old Yankee Stadium. And he said, I always wondered how a guy who was dying could stand here on this field and say that he considered himself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. And Mantle said, and now I know. I never, you know, I, because I was a young player in the National League, I didn't get a chance to see a lot of Mickey Mantle, but I played against him in spring training. And, you know, he was one of those guys, when he walked on the field, he got your attention. Even when he wasn't hitting, when he wasn't running or throwing or catching, he just was, had that type of persona about him. See the Yankees with the black armband and the number seven on their shirt sleeves in tribute to one of the all-time greatest Yankees, Mickey Mantle. This number, of course, uh, long ago retired. One and two to count. Two and two to Tinsley. It was interesting. His, his original number was six. Whether they were going to keep it in the line, you know, behind Joe DiMaggio, he followed Joe DiMaggio, and he was his number was six. He didn't. He got off to a slow start. And he changed his number to seven. Two and two to count. He got him chasing a bad one. Strike three. That ends the inning. Well, the Red Sox are very much alive in this one. Mattingly will be coming up by to John Miller with Joe Morgan back here at Yankee Stadium. Sunday night baseball, and suddenly 
We've got a tight ball game. The Red Sox, uh, big sluggers. Vaughn and Canseco erupting back to back with tremendous home runs. And here is Don Mattingly now to lead it off for the Yankees against Eric Hansen. The Red Sox bullpen is busy, even as Hansen goes to work here in the sixth. Mattingly is safe on an error by Greenwell, and he is also trying to knock a short. It takes ball one, one ball and no strikes. John, we're going to show you a unique look at both Vaughn and Canseco here when we get a moment. Strike call to Mattingly. One ball and one strike. Five runs, six hits for the Yanks, including a home run by Strawberry. Three runs, seven hits, and one error for the Red Sox. One got away. Just kind of disappeared beyond the glove of Mike McFarland. Two and one to Mattingly. <laughs> Left center, Greenwell, and there's one away. John, let's take a look at both Mo Vaughn and Jose Canseco in action here. This is the swing to watch. When Vaughn's pitch comes, it's out here. When Canseco's pitch comes out here. The thing to remember is that they like to extend their arms, the big guys, and they can really drive it. Watch how he reaches out with all his power right there to get the ball. That's why he was able to hit that ball over the left field wall. Now look at Ken Seiko. See how he extends out there and just drives the ball. All big guys like that ball out over the plate, most of the time up just a little bit. And I guarantee you, Sterling Hitchcock, tonight when he falls asleep, <laughs> is going to look, look just that way <laughs> in his dreams. They were both up there at the same time. He didn't have a chance. Mike Stanley is single and fly deep to right. He's one for two. And the change up in there for a strike. One ball and one strike. And when we're in Boston earlier in the year, Canseco was hitting more from a closed stance or a square stance. And I said to you then, and on the air, I said, I like Canseco better when he had the old open stance because he seemed to be more comfortable with it, whereas he could go to the ball better. In the stance that he had in Boston, it looked like he was always trying to catch up with the ball. Not quite as sure of himself on the fastball as he is now. And we'll, I'll show you that stance later on. Well, Kensenko has been in quite a tear. At one point, he had five homers in five games in a row. A curveball, and this is very high. Two and two to Stanley. Fernandez on deck. Yankees have had only one hit since they got the five runs in the first two innings against Hanson. He has settled in nicely. And he took this up to go that fastball. Three and two. He sees a series. This is the 13th game. Red Sox 17 homers to nine for the Yankees. Strike three. Two down. Let's take a look at Canseco. Before this front shoulder and his foot, they were squared to the plate. And I, th I thought he had problems getting to the fastball, but here, everything is already open. He doesn't have to fight to get to it. And watch, all he has to do is keep his front shoulder closed right there. See how he goes to the ball? Everything works better. And that's the stance that I felt he hit better from he just, because he just looked more comfortable from it. Tony Fernandez. Tony, uh, Oftentimes, when he was with the Toronto Blue Jays, would bunt, kind of chopping the ball past the mound to shortstop. And right. I'm thinking he was trying to do that there. That's a perfect bunt for a guy that likes to, to drag the ball. You square around early, the third baseman starts in, you just slap it by him. Right there. Over the pitcher's head. Alisea, no play. Base hit. Well, the reason that works is because you're on the move, and anytime you hit a ground ball from the left side, they normally get you by like a step or a step and a half. So you make up that step and a half by swinging on the run. And the catcher, Mike McFarland, is talking to the umpire because he felt like Tony was out of the batter's box. You see the chop over the mound. If you don't hit a line drive at someone, you're usually going to beat it out. Let's take a look at, now watch his left foot. He actually steps out of the batter's box. McFarland was correct because the, Here's Randy Velarde, and he takes ball one. Velarde is one for two. Yeah, he almost stepped on home plate on that uh, on that play. Yes, and you have to stay six inches from that plate. 
It's just they don't even draw that line right. It's tough to call it. But there is a line there. It's just not drawn. The batter's box itself. There is a line that's supposed to be right here. Well, let's see if he steps over that line. Well, maybe not right on it, but he's actually over the line right in there. Yeah. He is over the line, but it's very difficult for the umpire to call because there is not a line now, there. If he had stepped right on home plate. Yeah. But, but without uh, the line, it's Mc difficult. I thought McFarland was arguing that he had stepped out of the front of the batter's box because he was on the move. No, he was he was pointing out that he had stepped across, you know, in front, almost on the plate. I don't see the umpires making that call. No, not unless without the actually, line. Unless he touches home plate with his Three and oh. To Bellardi, Wade Boggs on deck. The Boston bullpen is going, and it has been throughout this inning. The left hander is up out there. That is 3 0. He swung away to Bellardi in 3 0 and fouled it back. 3 1 is Eric Gunderson up in the Red Sox bullpen now. That was interesting to let him hit 3 and 0 with Wade Box coming up next. 330 hitter, but maybe they felt felt like if he walked, Box would have to face the left hander. Well, he's got a little pop every once in a while. If he gets his pitch, he can pull one down the line for a home run here at Yankee Stadium. I don't know. I'm guessing. Well, that's <laughs> it's a guess anyway, because a lot of times managers just play a feel, you know, if they have about one particular pitch, and there's nothing wrong with that. Over the course of a, of a season, a manager will play a hunch a lot of times, you know, just because he feels that way. Three and two the count, two down. Fernandez goes. Well, he gets the walk anyway. Well, will take first. Fernandez over to second, and Wade Boggs will come up. And here comes Kevin Kennedy. So looks like he'll make the move for Gunderson. Five to three. The Yankees are leading in the last of the sixth inning. The firm of Vaughn and Canseco. Picked up by the Red Sox to get them back into the game, and they have done so. But now, Kennedy wants to make sure that their hard earned gains are maintained here. Didn't want to give it away. And there's the signal to the bullpen for Gunderson. So Boggs will be coming up against the left handed Gunderson, who's coming in. 5 to 3 New York. And all right, Carl, we saw Dante Bichette, 35 home runs now. With the. Uh, just having a fabulous year there for the Rockies. Here is Eric Gunderson picked up from the New York Mets. Actually picked up by Seattle from the Mets and then claimed on waivers from Seattle by the Red Sox. He comes down with two men on and two men out. There's Fernandez at second. And Velarde at first with Wade Boggs coming up. Join ESPN tomorrow night at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific for NFL Prime Monday. Leslie Visser will take you backstage with the Packers' Brett Favre and Mike Tirico, Joe Theismann, and Sterling Sharp. We'll have all the latest on Deion Sanders signing with the Cowboys. That's NFL Prime Monday tomorrow at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. Is that a Yankee fan? Yeah, that's a Yankee fan. And he's, he's excited, isn't he? Well, he's lifting, too. He's got a lifter's belt on. Yeah. Those look like primetime spectators. Yeah, they'll be watching. <laughs> John, one, one problem that Boston has here, they've lost all the momentum that they gained last in the top of this inning because Hanson was not able to retire the Yankees in order. If he would have been able to do that and get the Boston offense back on the attack would have been a different ball game. I think they've lost a lot of the momentum that they had gained with what they did in the top of this inning. And Boggs of course can uh, do even more. He can he can hurt him on the scoreboard here. He takes low ball one from Gunderson. Five to three the Yankees lead the Red Sox last of the sixth. Wade Boggs 0 for two in this game. Hanson is gone. He went five and two thirds innings so far charged with five runs. And fastball is a strike. You know, looking at some of Hanson's wins here lately, Joe, remember he's been handicapped a little bit because yes. he's not been able to throw his curve. His last win, he gave up six runs, but won 13 to six. Up the middle. Bay 
Boggs hits center field. Coming in to score is Fernandez, and Way Boggs has delivered. Six to three, New York. And that takes a little more momentum away. Well, a, a left-hander is going to throw a breaking ball. You have to make sure you get it down, or you have to make sure you get it away. You, you don't have to do both, but you can't throw it in the middle of the plate. This is the breaking ball right in the middle of the plate. Look at that. Belt high and in the middle of the plate. And a hitter like Boggs, he's going to hit that hard every time. Again, he may not get a base hit, but he's going to hit it hard every time. So here's Bernie Williams. Now, Bernie as a right-handed hitter, as we mentioned earlier. This is Bernie Williams, the power hitter. As a right-handed hitter, hitting 318, 11 homers, and only 176 at-bats. One for every 16 times up. His slugging percentage as a right-handed hitter, 602. And that's a power hitter slugging average. And yeah, that rivals the big boys. The Mo Vaughn's is 562, as if for instance. Canseco's is 585. And as a right-handed hitter, Bernie Williams, 602. Two men on, two men out. Bernie tonight is a left-handed hitter at a double and a single with two runs batted in. The ball one strike to count. There is Velarde at second base. Boggs at first base. Boggs is first hit of the game. Driving in a big run here. His 56th RBI. The ball one strike. Two down. Two on. Just off the outside by Gunderson. Gunderson from Portland, Oregon. He's been around a while. He's 29 years old. He went to Aloha High School in Portland and then went to Portland State University. Two and on the count. He was a Giants draft choice out of Portland State, 1987, and he's been up and down with the Giants for years. And with Seattle for a while, with the Mets back with Seattle briefly this year. Now with the Red Sox. Three and one the count to Bernie Williams. Two men on, two men out. Got the fastball in there. But that was a very good fastball there. He threw that one a little harder than he had thrown the other pitches, and that one had a little pop on it, and that's why Bernie couldn't pull the trigger. Two down, three and two the count. Velarde and Ball. Run in the dirt for the slider. So Williams walks. The bases are loaded for Paul O'Neill, who's in his hottest RBI streak of the year. Right now, six to three Yanks. Gunderson looked like he looks like he has a good fastball, so maybe he should use that by moving the ball in and out on the left-hander. But again, if you throw the breaking ball, you have to keep it down or at least get it away from the left-handed hitter. You cannot hang that breaking ball in the middle of the plate. Each team's bullpen has been busy. The Yankees, by the way, have a left-hander in their bullpen. Bases loaded. Two down. Ball one. Did he swing? No. Third base umpire Dan Morrison on the appeal. Appeal denied. Much more effective against right-handers, but he is not helpless against the lefties. Well, 267 is not a bad average because you do not face lefties nearly as much as he does right-handers. That's the spot to throw the breaking ball. One and one. Now, you watch this breaking ball. This one is down. Look at the rotation going down and away. The one he threw Boggs was really kind of a flat breaking ball that was right in the middle of the plate. Bellotti at third, Boggs at second, Bernie Williams at first. They'll all be ready to go on anything here with two down in the sixth inning. Perhaps the game on the line for the Red Sox. Way outside. Nice save by McFarland. Two and one the count to O'Neill. This is a chance now for Buck Showalter's Yankees to bust it open in the sixth inning. Well, if you're Paul O'Neill and you're sitting standing in the batter's box, two balls and one strike count, this should be, you should be looking dead red. Nothing but a fastball here. So 
Fastball, and it misses. He uh, tried to catch that corner, and he missed with it. But that's good hitting there by Paul O'Neill. He's looking for the fastball, but you don't hit one that's tough down and away, even if they call it a strike. There's nowhere to put him, and Yankee Stadium. Everyone rising to their feet here. As if to will the big hit from O'Neill. And he walks. across with the seventh run seven to three New York we did say the Red Sox had some momentum going into the bottom of the sixth inning didn't we that was a long time that ago was a long time ago now strawberry has been taken back to the dugout and for the Yankees somebody else will come out it looks like Ruben Sierra there he is Ruben Another veteran. Sierra has had 73 runs batted in this year. 17 homers. And he's done his best hitting from the right side. And here comes Kevin Kennedy. He's got Joe Hudson, a right-hander, up in his bullpen. He's going to make Sierra switch around and bat left-handed here. Seven to three, two runs in for the Yanks. Hudson will be coming in, and we'll be right back to New York. Back at Yankee Stadium, and it, it feels like pennant race baseball here, but the two teams playing are not in the same race, at least not right now. But the Red Sox already know they're going to be in October baseball, Joe. But here we're seeing the same old thing. They jump back into this game, and now... The Yankees are starting to pour it on again. Well, but I think it's important that they were able to bounce back from a five to nothing lead. They just didn't quit. They came back with three, and really they probably would have been able to catch the Yankees if they could have held them this half inning. But by the same token, again, they came back. I think that's the important thing. All right. What about the possibility of them meeting in the postseason? And this is well, their last regular season meeting. And the Yankees have already won the season series. They will, have, they will have swept the Red Sox here in this series. Well, again, we talked in the past about the fact that the record that you have against someone in the post in the pre in the regular season as compared to the postseason only matters to the team that wins. If you've lost, you say, hey, that really doesn't matter because we won the, the division. So I don't think this would affect Boston if they were to play the Yankees anytime in the playoffs. I still think Boston is the better team. Well, here we go. The bases are loaded. You've seen the runners. Boggs at third, Bernie Williams at second, Paul O'Neill at first, and Ruben Sierra at the plate. Joe Hudson, the right-hander. Three men on, two men out. Popped foul and out of play. Sierra hitting 259 for the year. All seven of the Yankee runs are charged to Eric Hansen. Gunderson faced three hitters. They all reached against him. Two runs scored charged to that man, Eric Hansen. And the three men on belonged to Gunderson. He gave up a single and two walks while he was in there. Oh, and on to Sierra. Too high. One ball, one strike. The Red Sox bullpen, especially since they added Rick Aguilera, the closer, has been a real strength for the Sox this year. But they're a little shorthanded tonight. Stan Belinda has been a great setup man for them. Is not available. He's had some tightness in his shoulder. Base hit. Vaughn scores. Here comes Bernie Williams. The throw is cut off by Vaughn. And he's got O'Neill hung up. And O'Neill is out at third. And just like that, the inning ends. But two runs score on the single by Sierra. And the Yankees have broken it open down nine to three New York as we go to the seventh Yankees nine Red Sox three as we head to the seventh inning now on Sunday night baseball join ESPN Tuesday night at 7 30 Eastern 4 30 Pacific for the Toyota Grand Prix from Laguna Seca this race marks the final IndyCar appearance of this season's champion Jacques Villeneuve before he moves on to the Formula One circuit next year that's the Toyota Grand Prix Tuesday at 7 30 Eastern on ESPN changes for the Yankees now as we go to the seventh, Mariano Rivera, talented young right-hander, on the pitch. And the new left fielder is Gerald Williams, replacing Dion James. And Luis Alisea 
leads it off for the Red Sox. The Yankees got four runs in the inning. The whole rally started with two down and nobody on base. It looked like Hanson was going to have another easy inning. And it, of course, did not end up that way. Ruben Sierra with the big bases loaded single against Joe Hudson. And it turned it into a six run advantage for New York. So the Red Sox three in the sixth, which put them right back in the game, answered by the Yankees four in the last of the sixth. And now the Red Sox are further behind than ever in this one. And in the three games of this series, the Yankees have now scored 26 runs against Boston. The Yanks are about to make this homestand a, a 10 and 3 homestand. It would also be their 11th win in the last 14 games if they can get it. But they also have a majority of their game, a vast majority of their games remaining, are on the road. And they have not their 12 games under 500 on the road. Gerald Williams will get a chance right away. One away. Alexander actually retired for the first time tonight. He's now one for three, but he did reach on a strikeout when the ball ended up being a wild pitch. Now here is Willie McGee. Well, it's been a kind of a sloppy game with the Red Sox. McGee's had a couple of problems out in right field that helped the Yanks get, uh, well, one in particular helped the Yanks get two runs in the first inning. Greenwell has dropped a fly ball in left field that might have turned an inning around. And then look at all of those walks in that sixth inning rally for the uh, Yankees. Hanson walked Velarde. The reliever Gunderson walked Bernie Williams and O'Neill. Let me make a point here about the playoffs. And that is teams who do not play good defense in the playoffs usually do not go that far. And I'll just make that as a blanket statement. And I'm talking about teams like the Dodgers who make a lot of errors. I'm talking about teams like the Red Sox. I'm talking about teams like the, even the Cleveland Indians who have been able to hit their way out of their mistakes. What happens when you get to the playoffs, you're going to face the best pitchers on each staff. They're not going to let you beat up on them, so to speak. So you're going to have to play a little more sound, fundamental baseball. That's what the playoffs are about. And anyone that tells you that the regular season and the playoffs are the same, they've never won anything because the playoffs are different. McGee down on strikes against Mariano Rivera. That pitch on our judge gun was measured at 94 miles an hour. So Rivera's got a little uh, heat. Here's Valentin. Strike and it's 0 and 1. Valentin singled in the sixth, starting a three run rally. Another good fastball right on the outside corner. All the teams are going to have to concentrate a little better in the field, play better defense once the playoffs get here. You know, the commotion with the crowd down below. A guy with a beard who looked a lot like Jerry Garcia, the late Jerry Garcia, the Grateful Dead. And the fans, when he came walking by, all started chanting, Jerry, Jerry, as if he'd come back from the grave here to attend this ball game at Yankee Stadium tonight. So <laughs> the Yankee fans are like delirious, Joe, with this league. To really drilled that one, but right to Gerald Williams. Three up and three down. Mo Vaughn left on deck. We go to the last of the seventh. Mattingly coming up second. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball is brought to you by Red Wolf Lager. Really red, really smooth. Follow your instincts. There's a look at Yankee Stadium in New York, and the Yankees are playing like the ball club in a pennant race. They're playing well. They're in the wild card race as they face the Red Sox. And they need a win tonight to remain a half game back of the Mariners in the wild card division. Here's Vaughn Eshelman on the pitch for the Red Sox. Young lefty started the year in the rotation and got three quick wins for them, giving him a little jolt at the start of the year. He's had some injury problems since. The battle will be Gerald Williams. 
Last week we were in Texas. We saw the Rangers and the Royals and Sam Horn veteran left handed slugger came up and I've known Sam for many years and uh, for some reason they said that Sam had been a replacement player which is just not true at all. I'm glad he to was, hear that he was offered a chance to be and he turned it down he said no way. And uh, so I apologize for that and I want to correct that for the record that Sam was not a replacement player and I'm certainly glad you're doing I'm, uh, I'm for Sam and his family and this right. caused a little bit of grief so uh, to set that straight. I'm glad you did that because Sam has always been one of my favorite people because we talked that day you know big guy gentle guy really nice guy so I'm glad it kind of surprised me when you said it because I wasn't aware of it but you know I always believe what you tell me. <laughs> well so for anybody else who might have believed it, uh, it, it it's not true. Good. Two and two the count to Gerald Williams. Don Mattingly on deck. And then Mike Stanley do up third in the end. The fourth Boston pitcher. That one is hit deep into Death Valley. And that's what usually happens to balls that get hit out there. Well, you you described it well as Death Valley for most players. But not Mo Vaughn no, and Mo can Canseco. And Mo can pull a mule team, and so can Canseco. So now Mattingly will come up. That's the view from the light tower here at left field. That's when they have a really big crowd. And he gets stuck up there. Here's Mattingly, 0 for 3, and he takes a strike. One out, nobody on. 9 to 3, New York is leading. For the win tonight, the Yankees will finish the season series 8 and 5 against the Red Sox. And Mattingly, among all active players. He's done the longest without getting into any postseason play. And that's a little Cut different it. than in the days of, say, Ernie Banks, who went all of those, his whole career without being in the postseason. Because difference. now you can, there's, there's four teams that, in each league that make the postseason this year. Two teams a year have been making it throughout Mattingly's career. Of course, when Ernie Banks played. Only one team just from the each one. league. Yeah. We're, talk, we're not even talking World Series. We're just talking any kind of postseason play. Off the glove of Alisea, maybe off his knee. And Mattingly is aboard. Well, we'll see how they score that. The ball was right at Alisea, but this is the second time in this ball game that Mattingly has hit the ball hard, but it's found a Boston defensive player. This one's lined. And it just actually it gets to him in the air and he's trying to he thinks he's going to short hop it. See it gets to him in the air it hits off the edge of his glove. And they're scoring is at an error so Mattingly has had two errors scored against him tonight. He had a line drive to left field that Greenwell couldn't come up with and it was scored an error. Now he's this line drive at Alicea so two line drives and nothing to show for. They talk about guys who play short hops and in between hops. There's a guy. He wasn't going to get any hop at all, and he turned it into a hop. I tell you. He just kept the glove down. He would have caught it. That was not good. Error on it. I was saying, to, to show you the esteem that these fans hold Matt Don Mattingly in, yeah. when they put error up on the scoreboard, the fans booed. And, I, and being perfectly honest with you, John, I've seen a ball like that scored base hits before. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Alice Hale will tell you that he should have come up with it. Stanley on the count one and two. Stanley is one for three. A single, a deep fly ball to right, and a strikeout. Nine to three. Yanks ahead, last of the seventh. Well, the Yanks have put a lot of runs on the board, but the Red Sox have certainly helped them. A couple of errors, plus a couple of balls that were not scored as errors and also should have been caught. McGee turned to. An out that would have been the third out of the first inning into a triple. Not only that, but it kept the inning alive, and uh, Strawberry turned the end into a two-run inning with a subsequent home run. There been walks. There have been bases loaded walks. High in the end of right. Into the corner goes McGee. And that is the second out. It's only 314 to the foul pole to the right field corner. Coming up now on Wednesday Night Baseball, Paul O'Neill and the New York Yankees, Strawberry, Sierra, Boggs and company against the Cleveland Indians. 
And right now, the best record in all of baseball. They've already clinched their divisional title. Albert Bell, Manny Ramirez, Eddie Murray, Carlos Baerga, Kenny Lofton, Oral Hershiser. What a lineup. What a year. Then the second game, Kirby Puckett, Chuck Knobloch, and the Minnesota Twins against Edgar Martinez, Ken Griffey Jr., the Seattle Mariners. It all gets started 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. They went to that doubleheader. Tony Fernandez, and that one would not stay fair for him. Oh, and on the count. Let's see, that uh, Wednesday night game, that would be, I believe, Oral Hershiser due up for Cleveland against the Yankees. He got the uh, win in their division clincher on Friday. Oral has won 13 games for Cleveland. Even though he spent some, oh, and they're saying Nagy's going to go? Uh, yeah. Well, maybe they have a day off. Anyway. Maybe they have a day off. Well, Nagy's won 13 as well. And that ball gets past McFarlane over to second base, goes Mattingly. Let's see, David Cohn went in here on Friday, so probably Cohn would uh, match up with Nagy. So you got Cohn, who's 15 and 7. There's David, he's 6 and 1 since the Yankees got it. And Nagy, a 13 game winner. Oh, I get it. Cleveland's going with a six man rotation for the time until uh, through next Friday. And they'll revert back to a five-man rotation. Maybe a pretty good sounds like a pretty good idea. I guess giving everybody an extra day of rest for a while. Cleveland's got a lot of experience in its rotation. But the key for Cleveland with that pitching has been that the starters keep them in the game with all of that hitting. And then they've had a great bullpen. Hargrove's done a great job. I mean, if you don't beat Cleveland in the first five or six innings, it's real tough. To come back against that bullpen, guys like Julian Tavares and Alan Embry, and of course the great closer uh, Jose Mesa, who's been like a sure thing all year. They're 54 and one against his pitch. Two and two, the count to Fernandez. He got that four-run sixth-inning starter with a bunt, with two down and nobody on. Mattingly at second, two down in the seventh. There's Mattingly. Oh, I always say, uh, plays this one, and that is the end. One man left. We go to the eighth. It'll be Vaughn, Canseco, and Naring coming up. Nine to three, Yankees over the Red Sox. Big Mo comes up. The Red Sox eighth inning. Vaughn who hit an astounding home run to the opposite field over the 399 marker at left center. Two run shot of a six. He's also hit a double. The curse is over. Magic number is eight for the Red Sox. And I guess that's the uh, the final word on this series. If the Yankees sweep, well, hey, that brings them to within 12 and a half of the Red Sox with only 20 to go so uh, it's the Red Sox who are blowing away the rest of the American League East including the New York Yankees and Mattingly himself pointed out just as did you uh, Joe to see Vaughn home run totals go up year after year and uh, Rivera misses inside 3 and 0 with Canseco on deck uh, Mattingly pointed out yesterday after the year said hey I have no illusions that this series uh, would be a lot different from the Boston standpoint if we were in a race against them. And I know that doesn't have the same sizzle for them right now as it would. Three and one the count. And that's a foul under the upper deck off of the left. Madden said uh, he likes this wild card. He thinks it's very exciting because there's so many teams involved in it. He says it, it makes coming to the bar every day that game is crucial for his ball club because he says you can't just look at chasing one team there's so many other teams that might win that same day he says you always have to go to the park with needing a win sure simply because of the fact that you know baseball needed a shot in the arm and I think a lot of teams have Given their fans a chance to cheer right on through, you know, to the end of the season. Otherwise, the races would be over. So I still think it's it's a good deal. But by the same token, the shorter the series, the more chances you have for upsets. 
<laughs> that one is cracked into deep center. But Bernie Williams runs it down. He did not get under that one. He hit it just as hard as he hit the last one, but this one was too low. Well, he has hit the ball real hard three straight times. A double, that incredible homer, and now this line shot to center. Sounded great off the bat. Well, he hits it. He just doesn't get enough elevation. He hit it hard enough. You can't carry it over that 408 without getting enough of it. You can see that swing. That is a powerful swing. Speaking of powerful swings, here is Jose Canseco. He also hit a monstrous home run. How about this? Since we're here in New York, Yankee Stadium, a Ruthian clout. That'll work. Yeah. Shallow right, Mattingly out, Velarde out, Mattingly still going out, and in is O'Neill. O'Neill, after all of that, made it look easy, and it was for him. Two down. Don't forget now, next Sunday night, Joe and I will be in Cincinnati. Barry Larkin and the Cincinnati Reds are having a great year. Fred McGriff, the Atlanta Braves are having a great year again. The Braves and the Reds, Chipper Jones, David Justice, the Reds, Barry Larkin, Ron Gant, Reggie Sanders, maybe they'll meet in that National League Championship Series come October. They can get through their respective playoff series. They seem to be the, the class of the National League. I don't see anybody else over there who uh, can play with those two ball clubs. I've always felt this year that I felt this year that the Reds are the best balanced team simply because they can beat you in a lot of different ways with power, speed, and they have a very, very good defense. So the Reds are very balanced. You have some other teams who are hitting well. Tim Nearing the hitter. He fouls one back two and one. Well, you know, one of the first baseball arguments I heard off the field this year is people weren't talking baseball when the season started. I went to Cleveland. I think it was early June or late May. I think early June. I'm walking through the airport in Cleveland. I hear two guys arguing about baseball. And then I hear one guy say, what are you talking about the best team in baseball? They're not even the best team in the state. <laughs> and then I knew that they were arguing about the Reds and the Indians. And wouldn't that be something? They could settle that argument at Riverfront Stadium in Jacobs Field in October, maybe, if well, they make it. One of the things to remember, as I said before, defense will play a big part in who wins in each, each league. Shallow right center, Bernie Williams, a long run. What a play by Bernie Williams. He's putting on a show out there tonight. Spectacular catch by Bernie. The play of the night. We're going to the last of the eighth inning. Bernie Williams will be coming up third. Nine to three, New York. Sunday night baseball from New York. I'm John Miller along with Joe Morgan, your Sunday night telecasters. Nine to three, the Yanks lead the Red Sox. We went over to Barry Hopper's house. Barry. One of the great baseball collectors. And he's got more baseball memorabilia than any place, I think, but Cooperstown. Yeah, he's got amazing. all these old uniforms, and uh, he said, Well, show us one of Babe's old unis, would you, Barry? Glad to, he said. Number yeah, number three. The Babe. And that's a picture from Barry's collection of Ruth as a Red Sox. He started with Boston and that's uh, one of Babe's old Red Sox uniforms with Ruth sewn into the uh, jersey. And of course the Babe with his number three retired here at Yankee Stadium. When the, the Yankees started giving numbers to players in the late 20s they just gave the number to the guy that he, of his position in the batting line. Ruth hit third. Gary hit fourth. Here is Randy Velarde. Who is one for two with a walk? He's facing Rick Aguilera, the Red Sox closer, who just needs some work. He has not pitched in a game in five days. And that's a ball outside. One ball and one strike. It's really uh, amazing to go to Barry Halper's house. I mean, it's like going to Cooperstown. The memorabilia that he has there. Something we want to show you a little bit later when we have a chance. We got a letter that was written by Babe Ruth to a fan after he retired. One ball, one strike to Velarde. And 
you know, his baby secretary, I guess, typed the letter out, but uh, the, the letter asks a, a question. Uh, uh, Mr. Walters, look at that, Babe Ruth, New York. I mean, what else would you need to put on there? And uh, the count is one and two here, two ball out. Broken back ground ball of third. Booted by Neri. Save at first base. Could well be another Boston error there. Their third error of the game. Well, you know, you can't say too much about defense. And he actually hit off the fingers of his glove. He just comes, brings his glove up a little too quickly. And then he makes a pretty good play after that. Close play at first. Just not in time. And Mo made a pretty good play there. Yeah. Scooping it out. Here's Wade Boggs. One for three with a walk. He scored two. And driven home one. Down the left field line. Deep into left field. And caught by Greenwell. Velarde was all the way to second. He has to uh, beat a hasty retreat back to first. Now Boggs missed his old Fenway days that time. Greenwell, what a catch, and he slammed into the wall afterward. Well, I didn't think he was going to get to this ball. This is just a fine play by Greenwell. Now watch, see how far he has to go for it, and then has to get there in time enough to time it just right. It reaches up. That ball might have been out of here. Nice catch here by Greenwell. Let's see if the ball is going to be over the wall. Well, very close. Nice catch. Nice play by Greenwell. Yeah. Well, let's get back to that letter now. The, uh, the, the question of Babe was answering were about the, the great ba uh, records in baseball today. And Babe says, the three that I feel will never be broken are, number one, Gehrig's 2,130 straight games played, Cobb's 367 lifetime batting average, and my World Series record of 29 and two-thirds straight scoreless innings pitched. Well, what Barry Halford did was he got this letter. Then he got those guys to sign it. Look at that, Whitey Ford at the top there. Babe, two out of three wasn't bad. Hank Aaron, the lower right-hand corner. Babe, you had the record for 39 years. Now it's mine. Henry Aaron. And then Mickey Mantle. Hey, Babe, you were right about uh, You was right. Roger did it. <laughs> uh, P.S. Babe, I took care of Cobb's all-time hit record. Pete Rose. And then he, even Eddie Matthews wrote something on there. Bernie Williams, base hit. Broken bat. Bernie's doing it all here tonight. He's got three hits, two runs batted in, a walk, a run scored. A couple of great plays in the outfield. Give me that all-star ballot, Joe. <laughs> Here's Paul O'Neill coming up next. Well, you're right. He's doing it all here tonight. Not a bad pitch from Aguilera. That ball started to dive, and he got it toward the end of the bat. That's why he broke the bat, but it's a base hit. So Barry Halper with that letter from the Babe, he got the other people to sign it. The records that Babe thought would never be broken. A couple of them had been broken. Whitey Ford, Henry Aaron, as O'Neill swings it at fourth ball and misses. Strike one. And now, of course, Lou Gehrig's record for 2,130 consecutive games played has been broken. So Barry's got a spot alongside that number one there. Gehrig's 2130 straight games playing streak. But Cal Ripken decided as well. It's a little bit low. One ball, one strike to O'Neill, who is one for three. The triple and a run battered in. Nine to three, New York ahead. In the last of the eighth inning. There is Bellotti at second. And Bernie Williams at first. And the fourth ball is low. Two and one. The Red Sox will be heading to Baltimore after the ball game. They got a three-game series at uh, Camden Yards beginning tomorrow night against Cal Ripken and the Orioles. And the Yankees are heading to Cleveland to face the Cleveland Indians. The Indians just on a roll. Vaughn's got it. Second. There's one. Valentin back to Vaughn. Two. Double play. Beautiful. That's amazing. They they played poor defense all evening. Now they make two fantastic plays. Three six three. Toughest double play to, to make. We're headed to the ninth inning. Yanks lead by six. Greenwell will be coming up nine to three. Boston trailing. Back at Yankee Stadium, and we go to the ninth inning. It is nine to three. The Yankees are leading the Red Sox. 
This past Wednesday, ESPN was at Camden Yards for some baseball history. Cal Ripken with his 2130th consecutive game. And President Clinton was on the radio with me, Joe, and Cal hit a home run. Are you name dropping here or what? If he throws yeah. one down the middle here, even on 3-0, we, we yeah, might see Yeah, he'll still Cal. swing at it. Yeah. Let's see. 3-0 to Cal. Here it comes. Swung at it! Gone! Go! Yes! Well, well, let me ask you a question here, John. Yeah. You sure that wasn't you doing an impression? I've heard you do Vince Gully. I've oh, heard man. you do Harry Carey. I've heard you do Harry Callis. Maybe you can do Bill Clinton. No, oh, he was right there. That's where we had the picture, Joe. Oh, I didn't see the picture. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my new broadcast partner. Sorry, Joe. I'm uh, sorry. I've enjoyed working with you. Yeah, if you're going to replace me, go to the top. <laughs> He's the only guy who yeah, can ever replace okay. you. Yeah, that's good. Although, uh, as we see the new Yankee pitcher Bob McDonald facing the pinch hitter Dwayne Hosey batting for Mike Greenwell. See McDonald's numbers for the uh, Yankees. This is the ninth inning. The Yankees are ahead nine to three here. Well, let's hope Greenwell didn't hurt his elbow. He looked like he jammed it when he made that catch in left field. And hopefully, you know, he's not not too serious. And maybe they're just pinch hitting here because they're so far behind. Greenwell's had a couple of uh, problems with injuries this year, crashing into walls before. That ball's back out of play. He, he really hit one terribly in uh, the Sky Dome one night. Greenwell's got his pant leg uh, rolled up there. Well, he's checking his knee as well, so he could have jammed his knee. And also, I know his elbow went over the top of the wall. Here's a look at it. Let's see if his knee hit the wall first. Yes, Ooh. his knee hits it as well. And he grimaced. You can see him grimace as he hit the wall. Two and two to Hosey. Jose is three for nine. He's a switcher to batting right-handed. Greenwell looks beat up, doesn't he? Yeah, he's grabbing his wrist and his knee. Strike three, and Jose is out number one here in the ninth inning. But uh, the president, you know, he was caught up in the whole excitement of the night Wednesday night when Cal hit that home run. I mean, he just he started shouting, as you heard, and uh, he jumped up and. Uh, Gave him a, an ovation with the rest of the crowd there. But well, Buck Showalter apparently afraid that this six-run lead is not big enough. He's going to the bullpen again. Hopefully, for the last time, we'll be back. The Yankees nine, Red Sox three, top of the ninth. John Wetland coming on to get a little uh, work in. It's been a while since he uh, pitched in the ball game, so Wetland uh, now has to face McFarland with. One out here in the ninth inning. The Yanks leading nine to three. Wetland has had a, a difficult year. And he's uh, blown uh, quite a few ball games. It's not what they had in mind, but still capable of being one of the uh, outstanding relievers around. And they're hoping that he'll get it back together here for the stretch run. McFarland to the plate. 0 for 2 of the walk in this game. This is a high fly ball to right and. O'Neill goes over into the corner and he's got it just like that. Two men down in the ninth inning. Stay tuned now, Sports Center, right after the ball game with Dan Patrick and Keith Olbermann. Kirby Puckett ended up playing the infield today for the Twins in that extra inning ball game in Anaheim. A lot of NFL highlights and then uh, Pete Sampras. He had a big day at the Open here in New York. Mo Vaughn, he hit a big fly here tonight, but it got the Sox back in the game. But now the fans are chanting, sweep the ones who are left. 27,527, the paid crowd, 110,000 for the three games of this series, including 47 yesterday afternoon. I'm sure they would have a much bigger crowd if they played this game in the afternoon. Lee Tinsley, strike two. Sterling Hitch Hitchcock. Is the pitcher of record for a win? Strawberry, a home run for the Yanks. Ball one. Final game of a long homestand for the Yanks. If they win this one, they will have gone 10 and 3 in the homestand. And they'll be a half game back in the wild card division behind Seattle. 
Tinsley just got a piece of it. He's 0 for 3 tonight. Ruben Sierra got a big uh, pinch hit when he batted for Strawberry. The DH position has driven in four runs tonight. Seattle swept Kansas City. The Yanks with the win will be a half game out, even in the loss column. Kansas City is two down. Texas two down. And everybody else, well, uh, sort of running out of time now. One and two the count. And it's over. Well, John, I think you have to look back at this series and say this could, you know, give the Yankees some momentum toward the wild card berth. And you have to look at Daryl Strawberry. He's given them a lead the last uh, Friday night and again in tonight's ball game. So Daryl could play a big role down the stretch. We'll see how they do in Cleveland the next three days. Then they go to Baltimore. We will be in Cincinnati. We'll get a look at the top two teams in the National League. McGriff and the Braves. Larkin and the Reds. Don't miss it. Eight Eastern, five Pacific on ESPN. Final score here, nine to three. The Yankees over Boston Sports Center coming up next. Stay tuned for that. Thanks for joining us tonight from Yankee Stadium in New York City. John Miller for Joe Morgan. Good night, everyone.